Uh, uh, last bit here wasn't really obvious, but I've erased all the equations and I'll mention it, but I'll mention it again. Which is that this line here, that line that I had relationship between H and B, which would determine what the, uh, which, uh, what the B field is in the material. That intersection down here, and as a result the slope of the line, depends upon the gap. So I had, I, I, if, if you want, I'll rewrite the equation. I will rewrite the equation. Only if I can find it. Here we go. Magnetic field in the core is equal to area of the gap over area of the core. That's going to be basically one. U0 over length of the gap right, times Ni minus HCLC. So the slope of this relationship between the two and the intercept over there as well depends upon LG. All right. So, so as, it, as I change the gap, now that I look at it, let's see, if I lower the gap, then this end's going to come down and uh, what happens at this end? The slope, if I lower the gap, the slope gets higher. In any case, the line changes. <laughs> when I change the gap, mm -hmm. all right? So, so th this isn't just um, a complete tautology coming back upon itself, you know, the, the, the nothing changes. It really does matter what, what the length of the gap is as a ratio to the length of the core, right? Um, but then in addition, of course, I need the gap length to be small compared to the area uh, to the cross-sectional, the distance across the cross-section of the gap, right? Otherwise, I won't be able to employ the approximations that I used. So approximations depend upon that ratio, but the actual uh, slope and intercepts of the line depend upon what LG is. Yeah. If you're using the table instead of using um, the cross-sectional area of the gap, would, would, that, would that approximation, like, could you get away with a larger gap because that approximation would yes. be lessened? Yes. Okay. You, yeah, definitely. And, and you, you can just find tables for gap to cross-section ratios for given use. Yeah, you, you, you can dr dramatically improve okay. that approximation. Okay, so that was magnetic circuits. Now I'm going to finish up on polarizers. I said it would be a hodgepodge. Um, so, we describe polarized light as having components along the horizontal and the vertical direction. And we can write that polarization state of the light as electric field is equal to some magnitude times a vector uh, cos theta sine theta, where that gives me my x and y, my y components of the, uh, of the electric field. Yeah. And the, 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 this is the amplitude and direction of the electric field. We, we, we should actually also worry instantaneously as to what it is, so I multiply that by cos omega t if uh, I want to have the full. By doing that, <coughs> I can now put a phase difference between the 
x component and y component. And I can uh, produce anything from linearly polarized light, where x and y are in phase with one another. That is, they're both fully real or fully imaginary. They've got the same phase, right? Uh, they don't have to be fully real or fully imaginary. They have to just have the same phase. Which means that I could pull a constant out of this, and this would be real. If I can do that, then that's linear depolarized light, no matter what the angle is. The angle just depends upon cos theta and sine theta, or upon theta, right? Uh, I can produce elliptically and circularly polarized light by putting these two out of phase with one another. When the y component is 90 degrees out of phase with the x component, I have circularly polarized light. And which way it circulates depends upon which way I put them out of phase with one another. And so I think I told you that right circular, so this is linear, right circularly polarized is uh, 1 over root 2 is the way that I'll write it, uh, 1i. Left circularly polarized, 1 over root 2, 1 minus i. Now I can operate on that polarized light with an analyzer. And um, I have these vectors that, do, that describe the polarization state of the light. In order to alter the vectors, in order to transform the vectors, these are one by two vectors, I uh, uh, need to have a two by two matrix. So the Jones matrices are the things that will convert one polarization to another or select one polarization from another. Uh, a polarizer with the um, transmitting axis transmission, oh, let's see, I've got horizontal. Horizontal is represented by this one zero zero zero. We can check to see that that, that works out okay. This is my um, let me do final <laughs> polarization state over here, and what I'm going to do is take linearly polarized light that is polarized at an angle theta. Oops. And I'm going to operate on it with a horizontal polarizer. Which gives me a horizontally polarized light out, and that's actually just Malice's law. I just made something really easy complicated. <laughs> but this can, this can be much more useful and interesting mm -hmm. if I have a whole bunch of polarizers, for example, and I've got them at a variety of angles, and I'm busily trying to figure out, okay, what do I multiply by what? Which term is which? Let's find, let's find the x components and the y components. Don't need to do that, right? The, the matrix for an arbitrary polarization is cos squared theta sine theta, cos theta, sine theta, cos theta, uh, sine squared theta. So actually, I probably shouldn't have called it theta. Let's call it phi. That's the angle at which the polarizer is set, or the analyzer, rather, is set. Then, if I want to find out what comes out, I just multiply that times that, and out it comes. If I've got a whole string of polarizers, then I just multiply them times one another.
each one of them being measured with respect to horizontal. I don't have to worry about the relative angles between things. And now what this has just become is a trivial computer example, a trivial MATLAB problem. Right? Actually writing out all of the, the products by hand can be a pain in the neck. But uh, once you establish what your matrices are, you can just multiply the matrices times one another really easily. So the outgoing polarization state uh, is easy to find. So you just, just use the same rules for multiplying matrices that you had uh, before. Right? Um, maybe I'll just say you have to be a little bit careful because matrix multipli multiplication isn't uh, uh, commuted yet. Right? Which is that you always got to ask what operates first. So the first thing that operates on the, uh, uh, on the polarized line is the first matrix here. So if I've got light traveling along, I'll choose to make it go this way. All right. <coughs> I have input polarization going into element one, element two, element three, element four. I need to multiply my matrices in that order, right? Matrix one, matrix two, matrix three, matrix four. Don't screw it up because going through a uh, 45 degree polarizer and then a vertical polarizer is not at all the same as going through vertical and 45. A good example would be if I go through, uh, if I start out with vertically polarized light and the first thing I do is go through a horizontal polarizer, what comes out is zero. Then I can add a 45 degree after that and nothing comes out. Nothing in, nothing out. Right? Whereas if I start with vertically polarized light, go into a 45 degree polarizer, I get 1 over square root of 2 for the amplitude. And then I go through the next one, I get one, uh, 1 over square root of 2 again. So I end up with 1 half of the original amplitude coming out. So the order in which you perform these operations is important. And I will make sure on a test that you have to choose the order uh, in order to get the answer right. I won't make it symmetric. <coughs> All right, but wait, there's more. There's a really neat set of devices which have got different speed of light on the vertical and on the horizontal axis. Those are called retarders. They slow the phase down from one direction and not the other. And so, get rid of the examples here. I've got my polarizers. So I can just use polarizers. I don't even need this. Because that's everything as far as linear polarizers are concerned. Okay. Um, in what's called a quarter wave plate. This is the most common retarder. You take one of the uh, uh, axes and you slow it down so that it ends up coming out one half wave behind. Oh, sorry, one quarter wave. <laughs> one quarter wave length behind the other way, right? The uh, operator for the quarter wave plate then would be this. There's going to be an overall delay, and I'll put that in. EDI, delta 1, during, during the whole plate, right? But then there's a difference between the two. And the difference. This one doesn't get retarded at all. This one gets retarded. That's a quarter wave plate which uh, takes 45 degree incident light and turns it into right circularly polarized. I think I gave you the homework. The homework to actually do that. This is pretty 
uh, this is actually pretty simple. Right. Um, did I give you? Yes. I gave you an arbitrary uh, uh, wave plate, which looks like this. There's e to the i delta 1. This always goes out. By the time you square to get the intensity, the, the overall delay is gone. All right? But I'll put it in there anyway. Times uh, 1, 0, 0, e to the i delta 1 minus delta 2, the phase difference between the two waves. OK, if the wave plate had some particular, um, uh, well, actually, we could work out what the thickness has to be, let's say. So I've, in, in my material, I've got <coughs> index 1 and index 2 for, the, for one polarization and for the other polarization of the light. Right? The thickness of the plate I'll take to be d. Right? The uh, number of waves, the, delta, the, the phase difference between the front and the back of the wave plate map in one orientation is going to be uh, N1 D over lambda times 2 pi. And the other one is N2 D over the lambda times 2 pi. So the difference in phase between the two, what we're calling delta 1 minus delta 2, is equal to 2 pi d over lambda n1 minus n2. So if I, if I know the index of refraction for each of the orientations with the material, so quartz has got uh, uh, two speed axes, right? Uh, two different speeds. And I know the difference between the two. By choosing the thickness of my plate, I can choose how much it's delayed for a given wavelength, right? Quarter wave plates really only work for, you buy them for one wavelength. Uh, and let's say you buy them for a green laser for argon ion 514.5. It's not going to work properly for helium neon or for a diode laser, you have to spend another thousand dollars for uh, for the other. But it does turn out that um, you can buy really cheaply quarter wave material that works over the mid range, mid red range, around 630 to 650 nanometers. Probably you can buy a quarter wave plate about this big for 30 bucks. Any other wavelength costs $1,000, but that wavelength, because it was designed for helium neon lasers back in the days, uh, is inexpensive. But so they figured it out. Yeah, they completely figured The engineers were set loose upon that problem. At least the engineers of the war. <laughs> Someone was supposed to re remind me, and, and I forgot, and you forgot to remind me, that I was supposed to bring my k -Row syrup demonstration with me. Today. So I want at least one person in the class to send me an email to do the, the uh, and, and, and I know it's probably religiously inappropriate, but I'm just going to say to do the Easter demonstration. Okay. Uh, because what I'm going to talk about next relates to that. It would have fit in very nicely with this. So linearly, I, have I done this before? Linearly polarized light is the sum of, for you guys, let's see, is the sum of right circularly polarized and left circularly polarized. There we go. All right. So right and left together, I've done this, I think, add up like so. I start them out polarized like so, and then a right polarized beam plus a left polarized beam cancels here and uh, adds up there, cancels, adds up. That's easy to see with uh, Jones matrices. Because right and left look like that. And I can just say <coughs> 1 i plus 1 minus i is equal to 2 times 1, 0. 
Right. So I made linearly polarized light out of right polarized and left polarized uh, there. Okay. Now, most organic materials have a uh, handedness to them. That is, that they, they form little helices. And, and the speed with which right circularly polarized light travels through material is different from the speed with which left circularly polarized light passes through a material. So one side's going really fast, and the other side is going slowly. So now comes the hard part. There's uh, no way you can do it. I go here, this one only, I'm going to have to do it in steps. Someone else can. No, it's a how to. So it went once around, it was originally there, after passing through a material, it turns out that now the linear polarization is that way when it comes out the other side. Still linearly polarized, left and right are still being added together, but I've shifted the face with respect to one another. So when linearly polarized light goes through a, an organic material, um, for example, dextrose, when it goes through dextrose, the polarization rotates in the clockwise direction as it passes through. If it passes through, what's the other hand? There's dextrose, leftrose. Sinister? Ambrose. Yes, sinistrose. <laughs> the other hand is, and why, why don't we know the name of this one? This one doesn't taste sweet. This one does. But chemically, if you're just analyzing chemically, uh, not organically, all right? But if you were just to analyze, you get the same thing, same mass, same everything else, all right? But they're just put together with different handedness. And so um, when you want to find out what the concentration of the kind of sugar that tastes good, you know, sucrose or glucose or whatever, is, what? You put light through it, and you measure the polarization rotation. Now the neat thing is, I think I said this last time, but I'm going to say it again this time, is that uh, the degree of delay depends upon the wavelength of the light. You know, we got a wavelength in there, two different indices. So for a given path length, I'm going to end up with different delays, just depending upon the wavelength. So if I choose my thickness just right, I can make the blue rotation very different from the red rotation for a given material. And it's very pretty. So I will bring that to uh, class next time, if I'm reminded. I'm expecting now that I'm going to get 44 emails. And that's OK. I know how to delete. <laughs> I already emailed you, so. What? I just emailed you, so. OK. I actually, I will say, not only do I know how to delete, but I know how to completely ignore my emails as well. <laughs> okay. Let's see. I'm trying to remember what I gave you for homework. Did you post it? I posted it. No. I wrote it. You should post it. And I failed to post it. Uh, you so failed. I'm so glad you remembered to tell me that. I will post it. Uh, immediately after uh, whoever after emails him after that should remind him to post the homework as well <laughs> all right so in a little bit, we're talking a little bit about waves now I want to talk about one more uh, idea that has to do with waves and optics and most of you have uh, had this hammered into you in your quantum physics classes but I'm going to take a, a couple of minutes for uh, those for whom it has not appropriately been hammered yet. And the reason that I'm bothering with this is because whenever we talk about, well, for example, here, I, I talk about the phase shift. I'm talking about the wave. And if I send, uh, and, and then you can say, well, that works. That's fine. That worked fine for that wavelength. But what happens if I send a pulse of light in? Then the way to think about that is that that pulse of light that you just created 
is actually composed of a whole bunch of monochromatic waves that add together in order to make the pulse. Right? Uh, you learn this in quantum mechanics. In order to make a localized pulse, you added together a whole bunch of, of uh, momentum uh, components. Yes, superposition of waves, beats. Right? And I just want to write down the arithmetic now because I'm giving you a homework on it in order to remind you of it. And the reason that, that I, I do that is because throughout everything that we're going to talk about here, we're just talking about one wavelength. We're talking about analyzing the reflection at a surface given a monochromatic wavelength. wavelength. The, the very phrase monochromatic wavelength actually means that that wave existed from the beginning of time and will continue to exist to the end of time over all space. Right? Anything that doesn't do that is not monochromatic. It can be pretty monochromatic, but it's not strictly monochromatic. All the analysis that we do here is really for one of these waves that exists everywhere all the time. All the beauties, beauties of the uncertainty principle. Yeah. So how do we take a light pulse that starts and stops and turn it into a monochromatic wave, or rather break it up into monochromatic waves, for which we can do all the analyses that I just talked about. And the idea there is the Fourier transform. So I knew it. barring factors of 2 pi, and the square root of pi, I'm going to write things this way. I can represent any function, and remember, this is a physics class, so I'm not going to be careful here at all, right? that, that fulfills certain conditions. Probably has to be continuous. It probably has to be bounded. It probably, continuous, yeah. bounded. And it doesn't actually have to be continuous. I take it back. If it's discontinuous, you have to have specific Yeah, I, it, it does not have to be continuous, right? But it has to be bounded. And it has to, the integral has to be finite. That's not true. It must be bounded. No, the integral doesn't have to be bounded. Then I can write that function, let's say, which is a function of, of uh, of a spatial coordinate x, right? as <coughs> the integral over all possible wavelengths, actually momentum a of k, k being 2 pi over lambda. Right? I'm going to write this in the old-fashioned um, uh, cosine and sine transform mode, right? But you can easily rewrite this using Euler's equation into exponential. But I have it in my notes. Oh. Where this thing A of K and B of K are the amplitudes of the wave components that go together to add up to uh, um, uh, is that one of those supposed to, is, are they both supposed to be dx or dk, or are they actually supposed to be mixed? Whoops. No, no, no. Yeah. I've got to integrate k in order to get x out the other side. All right? I could turn this around. And, well, actually, let's say that I know what the spatial pulse looks like, and I want to find out what the a of k's and b of k's are. Right. Uh, then a of k is, uh, um, is the solution here. It is the integral over all space. Notice this is over k momentum. The the, the wave vector can only be positive. Um, uh, Fourier transform can frequently be written as integrals over from minus infinity to plus infinity, and then you get a factor of two in here, right? I've written this from zero to infinity using positive k's.
that's an integral over x, and v of k is the sine is the sine integral. Um, there are a couple of quick observations that we can make about doing calculations here, which is that if uh, if f of x is a symmetric, uh, uh, let's look at the other. If f of x is a symmetric function, right, then this is uh, integrated over even limits. And so, uh, by symmetric, I meant uh, even function. Then this will exist. But if f of x is odd, then this integral will be zero. Right? So you can usually look at, at f of x pretty quickly and decide whether it's fully even, fully odd, or mixed. And frequently when it's mixed, you can take it apart into its even and its odd components, thereby decreasing the amount of actual work that you have to do uh, significantly. Okay? I will, I was, but I'm not going to do an example now, where I take a Gaussian pulse and show you what the components mm -hmm. have to be. It actually turns out you need a Gaussian in order to make a Gaussian. For homework, you've got a square pulse that turns on and turns off. But not just a square, it's a square cosine kx pulse that turns on.